out here. It is Tuesday night. It's election night, and uh, maybe you have better things to do than watch election, like watching me. I think I'll be more entertaining, honestly. And uh, uh, so welcome. It's, it's great to have you here. I'm glad you're spending time with me instead of watching the boob tube, uh, seeing who uh, uh, wins the election, which we probably won't know tonight anyway. Uh, it is Tuesday, which means it's Restoration House night. And I uh, gave some thought to what I wanted to tell everyone for Restoration House this week. And uh, something came to mind. I was just kind of driving down the road, uh, uh, thinking about this this T-shirt I saw. I really like it. It says, let me look at my notes. There's a T-shirt that says, don't complain about the results you didn't get based on the work you didn't put in. Let me say that again. There's a T-shirt that says, don't complain about the results you didn't get because of the work you didn't put in. And I, I just love that because what it's talking about is uh, uh, you get out of something what you put into something. And, and that, that's everything in life. It's, it's your job. It's your marriage. It's, it's your family. And it's also your faith. Uh, faith is not a passive thing. You know, being a Christian, walking the Christian faith is a very active type of thing you have to, get, you have to do. And there's a lot of work to put into it. But if you don't put any work in, you're not going to get anything out. And, and that's why the Bible talks about the word if over and over and over. If my people would do this, I would do that. If they would do this. If you do this, you'll get that. It's, it's all conditioned on the if. And so um, it's not that God loves us conditionally because he loves us unconditionally. However, our blessings are very much conditional. Um, and, and so uh, if you're not getting something out of your faith, it's probably because you're not putting something into it. And I want to talk about that tonight because what ends up happening in, 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 our, in our world, in our, in our fallen self, is we make excuses, don't we? It's, it's the bane of my existence, people that make excuses and won't take responsibility and accountability for things. I'm, I'm really hypersensitive about that. Uh, but it turns out when you uh, go to Scripture, God's pretty hypersensitive about it too. So I, I, I did this experiment today. I went to Google uh, and I typed in Scripture on excuses. And I hit the, hit the button, bang. And I got this place. I, I always go to this place. I think it's called uh, openbible.info. And what openbible.info is, is when you ask Google, scripture, whatever, openbible.info gives you all the scripture verses that deal with that topic. So if you have a topical Bible, I, I have a topical Bible, I put it somewhere. Um, <laughs> Nave's Topical Bible right there. Uh, this is a great book if you don't have this resource, Nave's Topical. You can look up uh, scripture verses by topic, but it turns out that openbible.info usually has a lot more. So. I, I saw all the verses and I was kind of stunned at how many there were. I highlighted it all. I cut and pasted it into a Word doc and it was 16 pages long. 16 pages of verses dealing in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, with people making excuses. And uh, I thought, wow, I, you know, I know some of them just right off the top of my head. But I was really um, taken aback at just how often uh, the Bible talks about people in situations just like we are, I mean, just like we are, making an excuse for whatever it might be, not following God, not doing what God says, um, not doing the responsibility, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. And so what I want to go through tonight is um, kind of the difference between making excuses and having results, because what you'll find is the two are not compatible. They are mutually exclusive. People who make excuses don't get the results they want. People that are results-driven don't make excuses. And so I, I want to go through Scripture and kind of walk you through what it says. I'm going to go through a lot of verses tonight, so bear with me. I still think it's going to be better than the coverage of the election on your news channels. Uh, so, but I want to make this one caveat before I get too, too, too deep into this. I got a flu shot today and it's starting to hurt. Uh, excuses and reasons for things are, are different. Okay, and I want to kind of walk you through an example. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible example. It's the best I can come up with. I'm not that smart. Uh, here's an example. If Lisa wants me to take out the garbage, my wife, and I tell her that I'm involved in a project and I, and I was really involved and I just forgot to do it, that's an excuse. That, that's just, I'm excusing my action for not doing what she asked me to do. That's an excuse. Now, What's a reason? What's the difference? Uh, Lisa asked me to take out the garbage, and as I'm getting out of my chair, because I'm old, I twist my back, and I can't walk. 
you know, and, and honestly, in my life, that happens, unfortunately. You know, hurt yourself. Uh, you twist a knee, you twist a back, and, and you're you're not doing very good. You're in pain. And I can't walk down the, the flight of stairs in the garage to get to the garbage can. And I would call her and say, hey, I can't take that garbage out because I just, I just hurt myself. That's a reason. So a reason is a tangible thing that influences and impacts doing something. Or an excuse is a reason that you didn't do what you were supposed to do that is you know, a justification for your decision because it's a decision you made. So I hope that clarifies a little bit because there are reasons that you can't do certain things. And I get that. It could be physical health, could be mental health, could be financial stability, could be um, a family circumstance. I mean, there's all sorts of good reasons why things can't get done. So I don't want to beat up on people about that. I do want to beat up on you if you're making excuses, though. Uh, excuses are just you can do what you're supposed to do. You just choose not to and make excuses as to why you shouldn't or wouldn't or couldn't or whatever it was. Okay? So now that that's out of the way, let's let's kind of get into some of this stuff. Um, I think scripturally you can you can like read it, but get the general sense that there's this thing called right and wrong, and that we have responsibilities to do right and wrong. I mean, there's all sorts of scriptures, hundreds of them, about following God's will and doing things His way, and you know, being holy because He is holy. And just over and over and over, right? Um, I, I think that we also know from scripture that actions have consequences uh, even in the beginning when, when Moses was reading the law to to the people the rule was this do right and be blessed do wrong and be cursed it was very simple follow God be blessed don't follow God be cursed and you know there you go uh, and it goes from there they see that if word again uh -huh. so we have a responsibility we have accountability we know right from wrong and we suffer the consequences of our actions. If we do the right things, we get blessed. If we do the wrong things, well, you know, you, you suck it up and you, you, you take your beating. <laughs> you, you get whatever you get. So I, I said earlier that I'm really hypersensitive to the accountability issue. I am. I, I grew up in a situation where I had a dad who uh, uh, was highly irresponsible, highly uh, unaccountable, uh, didn't believe anything was bigger than him, didn't care about the consequences of his actions, especially if they hurt somebody else. Uh, it was bad. And I grew up in that marinating in that environment, and I became hyper the other way. I'm hyper accountable. I'm hyper responsible. I, I just hold people to account. I believe people should take responsibility, own what they own. And if they don't around me, I, I tend to get kind of triggered by that. And, you know, look at it, kind of my head explodes um, because I want people to uh, not make excuses around me. And I get that I'm, I'm a little broken that way, but what you'll find is God's the same way when you start seeing these scriptures. He's a little hypersensitive about accountability. He's a little hypersensitive about responsibility. He's a little hypersensitive about doing what he's told you to do. Uh, you may recall a little incident called the flood. People weren't doing what they were supposed to do. Remember the Tower of Babel? He separated everyone, and, and they were supposed to you know, follow him, and they weren't, and they were disobeying and being evil. You know, God doesn't mess around. And uh, if you get to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, you'll find out that when judgment comes, he's not messing around. You know, he takes accountability, responsibility, doing what he says very, very seriously. And he's not going to take excuses. Um, so I'm going to walk through tonight uh, this part here, going through scripture and talking about where we see excuses. And, and th most of the stories you'll know, I, I picked the ones that were a little bit more well known. And I'm going to go through that. And then I'm going to go through uh, what, what uh, results driven looks like versus excuse driven because uh, there are some results we want in our Christian walk aren't they I, you know for me I'm gonna go through I'm gonna be kind of transparent with you and tell you what I'm looking for in my Christian walk and, and the results I'm trying to get and how I'm trying to get them and why I'm not gonna make excuses hey, hey Carmen we love you we miss you thanks for joining in um, so this is gonna uh, be a little bit longer, I think, uh, but I'll do my best here. So the, our first, our very first example of excuse making is right in Genesis. So God made man, right? He made Eve, and, and they're hanging out in the garden, and they've been told you can do anything you want, but don't eat the, that tree over there, right? And the first thing they do is Eve kind of saunters over there and eats the tree, gives to her husband Adam, who's standing there, didn't save her from it, and uh, then they realize they're buck naked. And they go hide in the dip bushes because God's walking through saying, where are you? And uh, 
Uh, Adam says, we're hiding from you because we were, we're, we're naked. We're embarrassed here. And God says, well, how do you know you're naked? Wait a minute. Did you eat of that tree I told you not to? Of course, God knew. But he wanted them to own it. He wanted them to say yes. This is the excuse making. Instead of saying, yes, we disobeyed. We're sorry. Oh, my gosh. We blew it. Eve says, um, Adam says, uh, I think it was Adam first, I gotta look at the scripture, uh, you know, if you hadn't, no, it was Eve, Eve says, I was deceived by that snake. She didn't say, I made a bad decision. She says, I was deceived by the snake. So it's the snake's fault, not my fault. She made the excuse. And he looks at Adam, and Adam says, if you haven't given me this woman, she's the one that did it. I, I'm not responsible. She's the one that gave me the, 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 the apple to eat or whatever it was. And, and, you know, it's your fault. You made her. You gave her to me. And so from the very beginning of sin, I, I want to point out two points here. One is germane to the topic. One is just an offshoot that I think is super important. The first thing they realized when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was they were naked. And sexual sin entered the world right then it's the very very first thing and that's why our, our our entire world is saturated with the sin of sex i just want to point that out um but second uh when they're having this dialogue with god and of course god knows everything they have the opportunity to say yes i'm going to take responsibility i'm going to be accountable i'm going to own this and they didn't do it they just blamed each other and they even adam even blamed god for making eve what was the consequence? Bye-bye. You lost the garden, right? So, uh, serious consequence for making excuses. I don't know what God would have done had they asked for forgiveness and said, yes, we're so sorry, we, 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 you know, we shouldn't have listened to the snake or whatever, but actually owned it. Maybe it would have been different. Who knows? Uh, but that's the very first one. The second one is, I got, I got some cheat sheets here, too, so I want to read the scriptures and get them right. You know me, I can I can paraphrase pretty well, but sometimes I bless mess up. Next one is Moses. <laughs> God's called Moses, right, from the burning bush and says, You're gonna go to Pharaoh and you're gonna, you know, be my representative, free my people. We all know the story. We saw the movie with Charles and Heston. Um, and here's what Moses says. He says, But Moses said to the Lord, listen to this, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. I can't do this. I, I, I'm, I don't speak well. And so from, from the very beginning of this, Moses is, is kind of rebuffing, saying, I can't do this. And then, and then it goes on. He says, well, who, God says, who has made man's mouth? Who has made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? It's like, dude, I'm God. I can make this work. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Well, okay, Moses said, hey, great, good idea. Let's do it. That's not what he says. But Moses says, Oh Lord, please send someone else. And then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know he can speak well. Behold, he is coming to meet you. So the idea of Aaron being the mouthpiece for, for Moses was not the plan. You know, God said, Look, I, I, I'll do this for you. I'll be your mouth. I'll tell you what to say. You'll be fine. And Moses is making excuses. Well, Moses is making excuses. Why? He doesn't want to go back to Egypt. He killed an Egyptian there, right? He's a wanted man. He's he's fearful for his own skin. And then I, I gotta I gotta go back to another verse here. Uh, let me let me see if I can find this here. La, 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 la. Um, then Moses says, "This is Exodus four. Behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you." <laughs> so he's still making excuses. Moses was a great excuse maker, and uh, now, now you can't blame him. I mean, honestly, you think of putting yourself in Moses' shoes for a second. You really can't blame the guy for saying, really, you want me to go back to Egypt where I'm a wanted man and free these people that are just a rabble um, and slaves and somehow defeat Pharaoh, the strongest army in the world, by myself? Really? The, the amount of faith that would take would just be amazing. And, and, of course, Moses didn't have that level of faith at the beginning, did he? We always think of him as this this hero, but no, he, he had some excuses, and uh, um, he was kind of always a little uh, with the, with the Lord, right? Uh, but Moses was was certainly chosen by God, and he, as he walked, and this is important, as he walked with the Lord, he learned and he humbled himself, 
and he and he, he fell under God's will. And this is why the, our walk is so important. When you first get into the faith, you're going to be like this. But as you walk with the Lord, um, you know, Holy Spirit will change you and soften you and do all the things you're supposed to do. How about Aaron? <laughs> Gosh, I love this story. So Aaron's a knucklehead, right? Moses goes up to mount, the mountain to get the law. He's going to get the tablets, right? And he's left. They, they've crossed the Red Sea, and, and he's left Aaron in charge of everyone. And uh, Moses doesn't come down. Remember, he's up there 40 days, 40 nights. And the people are like, where's Moses if we don't have Moses? And, and so they decide that they're going to make a golden calf. They're going to make an image. And Aaron goes for it. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron's part of the responsibility of getting the gold and throwing it in, in the pot to melt it to do it. So he's complicit. Aaron. And, and here, here's what, what he says. So he gets caught. <laughs> Moses comes down. He's mad. He breaks he breaks the tablets, rends his clothes. He just can't believe it. And Aaron says, let not the anger of my Lord be on high. You know the people. They are, you know the people. Not me. You know the people. They are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him, because he's on the mountain, right? So I said to them, this is, Mo, this is Aaron, let anyone that has gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire. And out came this calf. <laughs> like, poof, out came a calf. Are you kidding, Aaron? That is, that is like the lamest excuse I've ever heard. Um, just super lame -o. You can't just say, well, I took all the stuff, threw it in the fire, and bang, this, this calf came out of it. That's not what happened. You're lying. You're making excuses. You don't want to be held responsible for blowing it. And what gets me about this, we'll talk about consequences later, but, but Aaron, Aaron kind of gets away with some things here. I don't think he should have, but that's just me. Uh, but that's a great excuse. I, I just threw the thing in, and bang, all of a sudden, there was, there was a golden calf. We all know the story about Gideon. He was highly favored he was chosen uh, uh gabriel the archangel came down and saw him and what did gideon do right he's like well you know i'm not quite sure about this can uh, you know i'm a little fearful can you make the fleece wet can you make the fleece dry making all sorts of it of testings and excuses why he can't do this he's he doesn't have any courage um let me see if i can find the, the story from judges here in my notes because uh yeah it says here this is judges six and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now Gideon's hiding at this point. And so he's very confused why he's being called a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And were all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the land of the Midians. And the Lord uh, turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. <laughs> so he's like, I can't do that. I'm, I'm a nobody. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw the angel of the Lord come to me, I, I, it's the angel of the Lord, not Gideon, excuse me, or, or Gabriel, excuse me. If I see an angel come to me and start talking to me about God, and it's consistent with Scripture, and it's consistent with, with all the stuff, would I not believe? Would I not have faith? Would I not step out? And, and, and Gideon here, it, 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 he's, he's recounting, well, my forefather said this, they, there, there's miracles, there's this and that, but I'm the least, I, I'm, I'm just a shy little coward. He was a coward. That's the deal. And um, he was trying to save his own skin here by, by, uh, by testing God and saying he's not worthy. So there's an excuse. Now, here's a story you may not remember very well. There's a guy named, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but uh, forgive me. It's Nahum, Nahum, N-A-A-M-A-N. I always pronounce these wrong. And this guy wanted to be cleansed. And the story is in Luke, I believe. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, dun -dun -dun. No, that's not the story I'm looking for. That's a different one we're going to get into. Dun -dun -dun. Da, da, da. So Nam, here's from he had he had leprosy, and and uh, he was told that he had to go dip himself. This is Jeremiah telling him this, I think. He had to go dip himself in the. Um, oh, this was Elisha. This uh, excuse me, Elisha did this. He had to go wash himself in the Jordan seven times, and he said his flesh would be restored. Right, 
But Nahum was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that we would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. And so he's like, Aren't the rivers in Damascus better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in a rage. Okay. Obviously, he's you know he's from Damascus, and there's some some uh, rivalry. Let's put it that way. I'm not sure there was like racism, but there was rivalry. He didn't like the answer because he expected one, and he didn't get what he wanted. So he made an excuse of why he wasn't going to do it because Damascus is so much better. I can just do it there, which is you know why did you even come to Israel in the first place if you could do it there, right? His expectation was that God's a vending machine. He could just ask for something and pull the thing, and bing, he's going to be healed. And so his anger, his emotion, made him make all sorts of excuses why he wasn't going to do what he was told to do that would heal him. He would rather be right than be healed. He would rather be a leper than do what he was asked to do, which is dip himself in the Jordan seven times. Well, he stayed a leper until he did what Elisha said, which was dip himself in the Jordan seven times. Once he did that, he was healed. And, and so we'll talk about this in Getting Consequences, but you see that your emotions can get you in a lot of trouble. You, you you can you can get hard-hearted and and make excuses of something you're not going to do you know you're supposed to do but you're so pissed off and you're like i'm just not doing it i'm not doing that and then you don't humble yourself right which is what god calls us to do and then we lose a blessing and and you know you don't get a result you make an excuse and this is what happened with nahum nahum fellow and uh so that's another one how about jeremiah jeremiah gets called by god he's a he's a prophet and he makes the comment that he is um, too young to be taken seriously. Now, this kind of reminds you of, of Paul talking to Timothy, saying, don't let your youth be a burden, be bold. Well, in Jeremiah, I'm looking for it. He says, the Lord says to him, don't, do not say I am only a youth, for to whom, all to whom I send you shall go. And whatever I command you to speak, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. And so Jeremiah's first excuse when God calls him was, I'm, I'm too young to be called. I, you can't call me. I'm, I'm way too young. No, no one will listen to me. I, they can't take me seriously. And I get in that culture, yeah, even in our culture, young people aren't taken seriously. I was telling this 25-year-old kid once. I met him uh, somewhere. Uh, and he was a smart kid. And I said, you know, here's the sad part about your life. Uh, we all go through this. At 25 years old, you have great ideas, but no one's going to take you seriously because you're 25 years old. But when you're 50... And you, you're higher up in things. People will listen to exactly what you say and take you seriously, even though it's the same stuff you were saying t when you were 25. Um, age, there's age discrimination. People discriminate against old people, against young people. It just happens. Um, and and so for Jeremiah in that culture, your elders, it was a tribal culture, so elders were the respected ones. People with experience were the expected ones. So a young person coming out and saying, "Hey, the Lord's called me to be a prophet." Like, Ooh, yikes, right? Um, but God's always saying, don't worry about those things. I will, if, if God says, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to give you what to say, I'm going to be there for you, don't worry about it, you pretty much should do what God says and not make an excuse. So Jeremiah, as you know, comes around and ends up being this great prophet. He's one of the major prophets um, because he didn't just keep being mealy-mouthed and worrying about how he would be respected. See, that's what the deal was. They're not going to respect me. Don't worry about that, you know. They didn't respect Jesus. Come on. Okay, next one. I'm almost done, but I'm pounding this for a reason. Well, I'm almost, yeah. Saul, the king, the first king of Israel. How about Saul? Remember what he did? So he is waiting for Samuel to show up, and they're supposed to do a burnt offering kind of thing. And uh, Saul's not a priest. He's not allowed to do the offering. Samuel has to do the offering, but he's late. And so Saul gets impatient and does the offering. And this is how uh, it reads here. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. Uh, I'll find it in half a second because I know I have it. You just got to be patient with me. Uh, show me some grace as I try to find these things because, ah, uh, here it is. Haha, <laughs> I told you I'll find it. This is 1 Samuel chapter 13. Some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gil Gilgal. And all the people followed his trembling him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. So seven days was passed. Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. So Saul's like, people are leaving him. Saul, Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. 
and he offered the burnt offerings. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel came, yay! And Saul went out to greet him, and said, and Samuel said, Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering for me, and that you did not come with the appointed days, and that the Philistines had mustered at Mishmash, I did, I did this. And so what he was saying is, I'm justified in doing this. People were leaving. Uh, the Philistines are mustering me. They're going to have a war against you. Uh, I, someone had to do something. You didn't show up. <laughs> you know what the result was? He lost the kingship. He lost God's anointing. I mean, and he just made an excuse about it. Just made an excuse about it. So so um, that's a bad one. <laughs> there's, there's a parable Jesus tells. And I want to I want to just kind of briefly hit on it. He tells a story about a wedding feast, and what he's doing is he's making this imagery of the kingdom of heaven and the fact that 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 he and the, the the father has invited people to this wedding. And what his image is is he's the father and the people he invited is Israel. And people come and start making excuses of why they can't come to the wedding. And these are supposedly friends of the the, the father. Well, we can't do it because of this. We can't do it because of that. You can read the story. Um, all sorts of excuses of why they can't come. And, and the father is just really ticked off. So he says, fine, fine. Just invite rabble from the street. Just go find anybody you can to come. Right? And so the, the servants go out and they just find people. And they, and, and they bring them in. And, and that represents the Gentiles. And so in this story, in this parable he's telling, he's like, Israel's rejecting me. The Gentiles are going to accept me. Um, uh, and and the and the reason that the Israelites are are denying me is they're just making excuses because they don't really want to follow the Lord, they don't really want to do what God tells them to do. Right? Jesus said, "Not one jot or one tittle of the law shall pass till all is fulfilled." Meaning you got to do what what the Bible says, and you know they weren't doing what the Bible says, and so um, they were just making excuses that they were right in all the stuff they did. And Jesus was always hammering the religious leaders about all of the different rules they had. You know they had six, 613 rules on top of what Scripture said to implement Scripture. So you couldn't walk so many steps on a, on a Sabbath. You couldn't do this. You had to do that. And Jesus said, look, you're keeping people out of heaven. What are you doing? Right? And, and so this parable was, was really aimed at, at, those, at those religious leaders keeping people from the kingdom of heaven. But there's one point in there that's really interesting. In that, in that day and age, you had wedding clothes. And, and the father of the bride, I think, um, gave the wedding clothes. And one guest that was invited from the street didn't wear the wedding clothes. And the father says, why aren't you wearing wedding clothes? What, what? He goes, oh, you know, I'm just going to wear what I'm going to wear. And he gets kicked out. And the, 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 the parable part of that is when you come to the wedding feast, when you come to the church, when you come to the kingdom, you got to do it God's way. You can't do it yours. You can't do it yours. And, and so there's all sorts of excuses in this story, and God handles it uh, pretty brutally. I mean, Jesus is like, you know, if you ever notice Jesus, he's pretty black and white. He, he's uh, what some might call a concrete thinker. Um, he, he doesn't give you much wiggle room. He does just no wiggle room whatsoever, honestly. Like the rich young ruler. What do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Well, you got to obey all the laws. Well, I've done all the laws. Oh, there's one more thing. Um, I'm omniscient. I know that you have a uh, idol in your life, which is money. So give away all your money and uh, come follow me. And the guy walks away because he was really rich. <laughs> he had many possessions, it says. He couldn't follow Jesus because he made an excuse. Oh, I have too many possessions to do that. Um, another guy wants to follow Jesus, and, and Jesus says, great, come come follow me. And the guy says, oh, wait, i got to bury my father first. And Jesus' response is, great, let the dead bury the dead. And the guy's like, I mean, in first century culture, that'd just be, you wouldn't do that. But, you know, Jesus is like, don't make an excuse that you can't follow me. You have all the stuff you have to do. There's a line he says where he says, um, when you put your hand to the plow, don't you don't look back. And what he was saying is, when, when you get in the ministry, when you start following Jesus, there's no looking back. There's, there's, no, um, there's no excuse for you to say, uh, oh, about this, about that, the other. No, it's either heavenly things or earthly things. Which is why he says, keep your eyes on heavenly things. Don't put your trust in, in your treasures in earthly things. All, all, all the dualism that we talk about between heaven and earth. Uh, God's kingdom, Satan's kingdom, all this other stuff. And so, um, Romans tells us, Paul tells us in Romans, that men are without excuse. 
we we don't have excuses we know there's god it's self-evident right and so we don't have excuses so that when we make excuses um god's not gonna honor that he's just not and then this last part i love this proverb line i love this proverb song it says uh the sluggard says there is a lion outside i shall be killed in the streets an excuse why not to work and i'll just take a side note here and say i've met um a lot of men in my life who don't want to work and it baffles my mind because the majority i mean like 98 percent of the men i meet are driven to work their whole identity is in work and that comes from the very dna of adam because adam's first job in the garden was to work you got to go subdue the land and name the animals and you got work to do um, it's part of us but i meet men that don't want to work and there's all sorts of excuses i can't find the right job uh, the only work in a certain field. No one likes the resume. I've got a criminal background. I mean, whatever it is. There's always an excuse. And uh, um, I think Scripture is very clear about that. Scripture says you don't work, you don't eat. And that's not for the people who can't take care of themselves. You know, those who can't take care of themselves, we take care of. That's not, not the government. We take care of them. But in Proverbs and in uh, Paul's writings, it says, you don't work, you don't eat. The sluggard says, the sluggard, the, the sluggard, the guy that that's not going to work, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of hard things there. So you can see that, that scripture has just filled uh, a testimony of people making excuses. They make excuses to the Lord. They make excuses to each other, all this stuff. And uh, it's human nature. I'll be honest with you, uh, human nature we get it from adam and eve and it slides on down through the generations so the first question i gotta ask you tonight if you're watching or you see this um, what excuses do you make in your life do you have any are, are you pushing back against taking responsibility and accountability are you someone that just doesn't want to own it and if you are uh knock it off you're killing me okay no just kidding um i just it just is something that you got to wrestle with because god's not going to honor any of that that has no kingdom value whatsoever See, God likes a contrite heart. He, he loves it when you confess and so he can forgive you. He loves to show mercy, but he can't do any of that if you don't own your stuff. If you won't take responsibility and all you do is make excuses. If you make excuses, he will, um, you know, call your bluff on it. And you will suffer the consequences of, of your excuse making. It's just, just that simple. Uh, so uh, I would encourage you not to be an excuse maker. It just, it just isn't worth it. Uh, it. It may work here on earth because of the earthly systems. Uh, you may get away with stuff. People may even enable it for you. But we're talking about, we're talking about eternity when, and your eternal rewards and all that kind of stuff. It, it's, just, it's just not worth doing. Um, so let me go through and talk about the psychology of this for a second. Okay, the psychology of this is, is this. When you make an excuse, really what you're trying to do is hide some insecurity you have. Okay? So when you get, like, caught doing something wrong and you lie about it or make an excuse for why you did it or try to justify it, let me just go through a couple, a handful of things that you may be experiencing. This may or may not be you, but may be experiencing. It could be guilt. You don't want to feel guilty you don't you can't deal with feel guilty so you make justifications so you're not guilty um, I've met people like that that just cannot be held to account they can't feel guilty uh, it'll 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 overwhelm them some people feel shame and the shame overwhelms them so they'll make justifications and excuses and whatever rather than take account in uh, accountability and responsibility some people have fear um, and, and are triggered in that and are, are fearful of the consequences of taking responsibility, right? Some people are, have, have, are in, unable, un, unable. I have this great boss at Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs. Her name's Paula Brown. She, she was the deputy director. And Paula uh, had this great line. She used to say when people weren't doing something right, she'd say they're either unwilling or they're unable. It's one or the other. And I thought about that and I said, you know, she's just right spot on. Because if you're either unable to do something because you don't have the capability, which is one thing, or you're unwilling to do something, which is a, a decision for whatever reason. It doesn't matter what your motive is, but you're unwilling to do it. And that's what it really, really comes down to. And so some people are unable to do things. And so they're unable to 
instead of just owning it and saying, hey, I just can't, I can't do that. They'll make excuses because they think they should do it, but they're not going to be able to do it. They'll mess it all up, and they'll make excuses of why it didn't happen. Instead of just saying, I'm unable to do that. Okay. Um, lack of boundaries is one. So people won't take accountability and responsibility because they don't have boundaries. They don't have the right boundaries. Um, they can't say, uh, like I just said, they can't say, no, I can't do that. And they'll say yes and then fail. And they make an excuse why they do. I, I, I've got a brother that does that to me because it's really hard for him to have a boundary to say no. He wants to tell everyone yes. And when he does and then he fails, it's like, well, this and that happened. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, just, just admit you shouldn't have done it. But he can't. He just can't in his psychology get there. So there are lots of reasons beyond that where the psychology of excuse making is is pretty deep seated. And it's based upon your trauma. It's based upon your life experience. It's based upon your history. All sorts of different things. So I get why we make excuses. But but here's the rub. As a Christian, we're supposed to be new creations in Christ. We're supposed to be uh, born again of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're supposed to be striving to be more Christ-like. We're supposed to fight uh, a spiritual battle every single day. Uh, we're supposed to get better. And uh, uh, most Christians I know really aren't trying that hard. They're just kind of, they, you know, most Christians are like this. They come up, 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 and they plateau. And they just stay there. Boo. And, you know, it's like, it's like. No, tick, 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 they just they just flatline and and they're they're comfortable in the flatline they find their place in the faith where they're comfortable and they stay there well i don't read anything in scripture that says be comfortable my life is extraordinarily uncomfortable because god's calling me every day to give more and more and more and more and he's right and i and, but it, it, the pruning process is painful and it's not comfortable but I want to be Christ-like. I want to be a disciple. I want to be someone after God's own heart. I want to be that guy. And I'm committed to it. See, see, my, my mission, the results I want, don't allow me to make any of the excuses. Because I'll never meet God where I want to meet him if I do. But you have to be someone who really wants to meet God there. I mean, that, I mean, that's really the bottom line. What's your motivation? If your motivation is yourself, no, nope, you won't get there. If your motivation is your spouse, no, nope, you won't get there. If your motivation is your job, if your motivation is money, if your motivation is anything in this world, your kids, um, you're not going to get there. Your motivation has to be Jesus. And only through the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit will that motivation result in you not making excuses and being able to move forward, right? Um consequences of excuses i told you i'd get to this so adam and eve you know kicked out of the garden they made the excuse bang they're gone moses um he was overruled you're not slow speech shut up move on and and he but he was given help by aaron and then uh aaron somehow escapes the punishment that everyone else had to face remember god comes down and, and does some punishment there after the golden calf issue he spares aaron because he's got plans for him for the priesthood but Aaron, you know how much shame Aaron must have had for doing that? Um, I'm sure he lived with a deep shame and regret over what happened. And we don't know from the story because the Bible's silent on it, but perhaps Aaron, after saying the cow jumped out of the fire, uh, Aaron, I could just see Moses look at him going, really? Um, maybe Aaron came to his senses and repented. Who knows? We, that, that, the, the Bible's silent on that. Um, we talked about Nam. He got angry, but eventually gave in, and he was eventually healed. Jeremiah was told directly not to make excuses, and he shut up and did what he was supposed to do. So good, good consequences when you follow, right? Saul lost the kingship. Uh, the wedding guests who had excuses for not coming to the parable of the wedding uh, were kicked out of heaven. They didn't get the kingdom of God. Um, the rich young ruler lost heaven. He doesn't get the kingdom of God. The guy who wanted to bury his father before joining Jesus, if he did so, he didn't get the kingdom of heaven. He didn't go to, to, to heaven with, and be with Jesus. So what about you? What about you? Um, where are you at with your excuses? Let's talk about something. Um, let me ask you this question. What have you lost due to excuse making? Because there's always a consequence, right? Have you lost a job? Have you lost relationships? Have you lost um, respect? Rep, uh, your, your reputation's been soiled? Have you lost opportunities? Have you lost your faith? Have you lost yourself? 
to addictions or to you know false idols because you're making excuses instead of following the Lord I know that's harsh but darn it that's truth that's just truth you got you got to have a sober judgment you got to look at yourself and you know don't justify the crap you're doing if you're doing the wrong thing just say dang it I'm doing the wrong thing go to God say I'm doing the wrong thing I can't stop doing the wrong thing I want to do the right thing I can't do it like Paul did. He says I don't do the things I want to do I do the things I don't want to do I'm a wretched man he's crying out to God he didn't say well I, I you know my life's hard man I, I, I should be able to have a few little foibles here and there for goodness sakes I've been shipwrecked three times put in prison beaten thrown thrown off a cliff for goodness sakes give me a break he didn't say that he was just honest with God and owned it and that's our example right so um, you know who some of the biggest excuse makers are atheists or people that don't go to church that supposed believers right let me tell you what their excuses are you've heard these the church is full of hypocrites I'm not going there <laughs> that's just an excuse not to be in front of God how about this one oh the churches are they're just about money oh okay you don't have to give you can go to church and find out what God's about but you don't want it you don't want to go to God because you know in your heart God's convicting the Holy Spirit's convicting you that if you end up in church you know he's gonna see and you're gonna be convicted and you don't want that how about this one more wars have been started and, and fought over over religion and more people have died because of that than anything else in history okay men are sinful what does that have to do with your relationship with Jesus right just another excuse here's a good one uh, I don't I'm not gonna serve a God who forces me to love him or sends me to hell how about that one you love that excuse um, you don't know Jesus at all and you don't want to know Jesus you're just angry you're probably angry at God over something oh I love this one too oh oh, oh I don't I don't need religion I'm spiritual <laughs> whatever the heck that means right Hope you enjoy rubbing your crystal. Um, just nutty, nutty excuses. And God shall have none of it. Now, here's what Scripture says. Um, Jesus is talking about the, you know, the, the gate to get into heaven. He says, the gate is narrow and few find it. It doesn't say the gate is narrow and few get into it. It says few find it. You actually have a responsibility to search for it. And how you find it is through your transformation and becoming more like Jesus. All right few find it and few in the church find it that's the sad news that's the saddest news of all so um, I don't think excuses are gonna get you to where you want to go in life if you have any goals personal goals if you have anything in life that you want to accomplish you're not gonna get there by excuse making um, Benjamin Franklin put it this way he said uh, he who is good at making excuses is seldom good for anything else I just found that today I love that he was good for making excuses is seldom good at anything else and even two three hundred years ago uh, people knew heck, heck in Bible times they knew but Benjamin Franklin was just putting it right out there these people are worthless you're an excuse maker we don't need you and uh, um, but that doesn't mean if you are excuse maker that you're lost and you know you're not redeemable you just got to change your ways you got to have a pivot in your life you got to have a plot twist you got to get in there and change things and, and that's a, an intentional I'm going to do something different and uh, you got to think about it for, so first you got to label it second you got to identify where you're making excuses third you got to figure out why you're making those excuses is there deep pain is there something going on that you got to heal fourth you got to reconcile those things that are causing you to make excuses and then five you have to have the courage and this takes boldness to accept your responsibilities and accountability for what you own don't accept stuff that's not yours to own um, too many people out there accept crap that's not theirs they're carrying rocks that aren't theirs it's it's weighting them down and then they enable other people and they make excuses of why they're enabling somebody else and carrying stuff that's not theirs it's ridiculous that you know that's not what God wants out of you you can't have an abundant life and meet your responsibility and your mission in life by doing that that's just not gonna work okay so this thing works both ways you can't take responsibility for somebody else scripture is very clear everyone's responsible for their own sin this is important because um, understand when you meet Jesus and all of us are going to he's not you know for me for example when I meet Jesus he's not gonna ask me about Lisa 
and her life. He's going to ask me about me and how I did what I was supposed to do. I, I, I'm not getting interrogated for my, for my blessings and my rewards about Lisa. I'm going to get asked about my actions, my thoughts, my words, my reactions, how I uh, held the faith, how I told the truth. Did I preach the gospel? Did, did, was I ashamed of his name? Right? All those things, that, that, that's going to happen with me. None of us are going to be asked about anybody else. So don't carry people's rocks just to enable them. That, that's, a bad, that's a bad thing because it allows them not to be responsible. It allows them to make excuses as you're making excuses while you're doing something to enable someone else to make excuses. Don't do it. Just draw a line. I know it's hard, but suck it up and do it. There was this great guy. He was named uh, Dick Marshenko, and he was the SEAL Team 6 commander, and he has a great line. He said, thou hast not to like it, thou hast simply to do it. And that's, and that's kind of what I'm preaching tonight. I'm kind of, kind of on a roll. I'm being, uh, you know, ex exhortation tonight because I just feel so strongly about this. So um, let's go in here and talk about the positive end. Let's talk about results. Okay, all of us want certain results, and I and I think that um, we all know there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything in life has a cost. Okay, no matter what you do, there's a cost for what you do. Now, some of us don't mind some of the costs. Some of the costs are pretty heavy, and we do it anyway, right? Because it's a good investment. Our faith has a cost. Think about it. Um, we have to transform. You know, if you're in the faith, if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It is not an option to transform or not. You must transform, or you are not in the faith. That, it's that simple. And, and so transformation is painful. It's scary. It's uncomfortable, right? But it's necessary because I always tell people, God loves you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And if you truly love the Lord and you truly want to follow him, he's going to bring you on a journey, and that journey is going to be difficult. I said I'm friend of mine, uh, uh, I guess a, a meme or something today, that said, uh, Lord, why are you bringing me into deep water? And the Lord responded, because your enemies can't swim. That's how our life is sometimes, right? So there's a saying that says, um, well, let me talk about transformation. There's this line I want to I share with you. Transformation can be the most painful, joyous thing you've ever experienced. The most painful, joyous thing you've ever experienced. Because transformation is great, but it is, it is painful. So there's this line that says, uh, uh, you can have results or you can have excuses, but you can't have both. They are mutually exclusive. So let's talk about um, what results I'm talking about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of be transparent here in the back end of this and tell you uh, about my life a little bit. As a follower of Jesus, um, I think the Holy Spirit is a, is, is a vital component of what we're talking about. I don't think I can have any transformation or do any of the things I'm talking about, not make excuses, take accountability, take responsibility without the power of the Holy Spirit. In my own flesh, I will lie, cheat, steal, I will do all the things I'm not supposed to do. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that allows me to follow Jesus um, and be revealed to all the rest. Okay, So um, don't think I, I'm perfect at this or have a big head or anything. I am, of all the sinners out there, I'm the worst. And my battle is my battle. And your battle is your battle. But we got to hang tight to the Holy Spirit because that's that's what's the power behind anything we can do here. So I would tell you that that we all should have some, um, we should all have some results we want to have that look like Jesus. Okay, You know, if you're a follower, you're trying to be like Jesus, be Christ-like. That's what we say in the church. But we have to think about our spiritual, physical, emotional, and even material results that we want to get. Okay? And so I'm going to go through what, just some transparency in my life, not tell you everything. Uh, Lisa might barge into my room and shut me up. Uh, tell you some, some things in my life, things that are the results I'm looking for. So let's talk about spirituality. Spiritually, I want to be more like Jesus every day. He has to become more. I have to become less. I have to understand from reading scripture what he said, why he said it, what he means, and how it applies to my life, and, why, and the changes I have to make to meet him where he is. I want that. That's my result. And I can't make excuses that I am sinful, uh, I'm in the flesh, I'm, I'm, I'm unworthy, uh, whatever it is. No excuses. 
every day I got to fight for that. Now there's days I'm better at it than others, but most days I fail, but I get a little closer. That's, that's a results driven thing. No excuses, no excuses or I'll never make it. Next, I need to fight the thorns that are in my side, those messengers from Satan, the sin life that I have. This is brutal for me. I mean, cause I have many and, uh, um, I can make all sorts of excuses of why I have them. Oh, I'm a poor, abused child as a kid, and I'm this and I'm that. My brain doesn't work. I got PTSD, blah, 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 blah. I can make excuses, and you know what? Some of them would be absolutely legitimate. But they're not to me. I need to do better. That's all there is to it. I need to fight harder. I need to rely on the Holy Spirit more. I need to be transformed more significantly. I need, I need the, 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 the guy that's got the clay, you know, that, that God's got that clay and he's forming it. I need him to slap that thing down on the table and start over. <laughs> you know? I, need, I need serious transformation in some areas. Yeah, I could make all sorts of excuses. And honestly, in this world, people would say, you're absolutely right. You have every reason. No, I don't. And this is what I mean by the black and whiteness of making excuses or getting results. If I want results, I can't, I can't, you know, lean back on excuse making because I'll never get there. How about this one? Uh, I want to exhibit my spiritual fruit more readily. Uh, I think my mind, like most minds, when I'm thinking about God, it's pretty, God, it's pretty uh, focused until squirrel. <laughs> and then I'm off on another tangent. I need to exhibit peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I want people to see that in me. It's hard because I'm not the most gentle guy. It's hard because I'm, uh, you know, not the most patient guy. I, I'm, I'm a strong-willed. I have a lot of intensity to me. I'm a strong leader. I'm a military guy, and it's awfully hard for me sometimes to to exhibit and bear those spiritual fruit pieces. And I need to be better at it. Now I can make excuses about that too, because there's reasons I am the way I am, and there's reasons God made me this way. He, you know, He wants me to be a door kicker and do some things, but I've got to be able to have that spiritual fruit as well. So I struggle, I struggle with that. I strive. I want to love people more deeply. I, I want to, I want to, I want to see the world as Jesus sees it. I want to see people as Jesus sees it. I want to look into everybody's eyes and say, "There is the image of God." Everybody's a gamble. I want to see that every time, and I don't have that every moment of my life. Um, I want to share the gospel anywhere and everywhere. And I do a pretty good job of sharing Jesus, but I'm not direct enough about getting people to um, accept the invitation. Um, I treat it more like recruiting an, an intelligence agent where we do this long dance until, until they're ready and then we do it instead of really just driving the point home when they need it. And so I got to be better in that. So that's spiritually what I'm kind of aiming for in terms of results stuff. As you can see, there's all sorts of reasons that I wouldn't talk to people. Ah, oh, you know, it might offend them. Oh, you know, I don't want to bother them at the store. Oh, you know, they're not going to listen to me. I could, I could just do that over and over and over. All those excuses. And believe me, Satan whispers those things in my head when I'm going to do it. I just got to shut them up and go do it. Right? Shut up and do it. That's what I, that's what I tell myself. <laughs> just got to go do it. Physically, um, some of you know, some of you don't. I, I'm a complete... 100% disabled vet. I'm, I'm completely disabled according to the government. Um, and I am pretty broken. I'm pretty sick. Uh, but I want to give 100% of what I have every day. Now, if there is someone who can make excuses for not feeling well, it's me. I try not to do that. I really make an effort to just suck it up and drive on. God's got work for me to do. And you think about Paul. The guy's beaten with rods, and he's still in prison singing hymns. I mean, come on. I'm not beaten with rods. I just don't feel well, and I hurt, and, and whatever I got, right? Um, I want to give 100% of whatever I have every day. I want to uh, be able to accomplish my mission every day. I want, I want to rely on the Holy Spirit's power to drive me to mission accomplishment, whether I'm counseling somebody or, or I'm... I'm writing a blog, or I'm preaching tonight, whatever it might be. And I'll be honest, got here tonight, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, it's a long day. But I'm on fire because the Lord is, is, is booing me, he's, he's holding me up because, you know, this is the thing I strive for, is results driven. I'm not going to let God down. You know, he's called me to preach the word, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let him down. It doesn't matter how I feel, right? Um, I want quick remedies when I do fall, because I do fall. And I just want God to just 
fix me, get me back up. I always tell all my doctors, your job is to keep me upright so I can keep doing what I do. And then I want endurance and perseverance when it gets really difficult. Um, I want the, the strength of I want the strength of Samson, man. I just want I, I, I strive for this idea of, of just being able to really suck it up so that I'm not an excuse maker. So that I can keep going every day because if I fall in the trap of feeling sorry for myself or allowing the pain and discomfort and all the crap I have to overwhelm me, I'll stop doing what I do. And I just won't allow it. Because God's got plans for me. Then lastly, physically, I want to find joy in all these circumstances. You know, there are times I'm throwing up because I have some stomach issues. And I'm just thanking the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that I have a toilet to throw up in. It's great. That sounds weird, doesn't it? But, you know, I'm thankful. I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, he always gives me the logistics and facilities I need when I need them. Um, that, that's, I, I'm, I'm grateful, honestly grateful. And I'm grateful that after I chow that um, I can recover and get right back to doing what I'm doing because he gives me the strength to. I know that's not normal. So I don't make excuses. Emotionally, I'd like to be more stable and consistent in my mood. With PTSD, man, I'm all over the board sometimes. And past like two months, I've been just really discouraged and down. And I started this new, um, not a new prescription, but a, uh, an increase in it. And wow, it's got me happy. Um, my doc told me today, yeah, it'll do that to you. I'm like, I'm glad. Just keep giving it to me. Um, I want more consistency and stability. And that's got to come through God. See, see, I have to rely on him for that. I can't rely on me for that because I'm not going to be able to get there. My brain's not going to do it. I got brain chemical issues. But the Lord can do it. He can heal. He can He can drive drive all that stuff. He can help me out, right? And I got to remember to rely on him instead of just falling into that dark hole. Uh, I want to treat my wife better when I'm triggered. I mean, when I'm triggered, I'm I'm not a I'm not a, a, a joyful person to be around. Um, I want to be able to treat her better, and the Lord's the only one that can help me with that. Because when you're triggered, you know, brain just shuts off. At least the logical part of it does. I need God to get in there and the Holy Spirit to get me out of that spiral before it gets to that point, right? And so I got to rely on Him on that, and I can't make excuses. You know, I could. I've got PTSD for God's sakes. I. I have trauma. I have all sorts of things. There are reasons. Remember I said there's a difference between reason and excuse. There are reasons I am the way I am. But I'm not going to make excuses and say, well, that's okay now. I used to when I was younger, believe me. I said, well, I have this hard life, so it's okay I'm angry. Um, I, I have all this, all these demons I can't sleep at night, so it's okay I drink. It's like, you know, I had all sorts of excuses and reasons. Now I don't do that. There's no reason. There, 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 I, I, I have got to be able to be deeper in my faith to make this stuff work. I'd like to be triggered less often, right? I need this work on reconciling some things and figuring out some triggers and managing it better and all that. And that only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't do that myself. Now, do I have an excuse to be triggered if you knew my life? Heck yeah. Heck yeah, I have reasons to be triggered. Heck yeah, I have reasons to, ha to have the reactions I do. Is it okay? No, it's not okay. It's never going to be okay. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I need Jesus in my life transforming me into a person that's triggered less. And believe me, over the years, whoo, has he done a job. If you knew me in my late teens, early 20s, you would have not recognized me. And I like to be less discouraged. Sometimes I, uh, with what I have, um, I get kind of down. I, get, I, I have negative, I have what they call stinking thinking. A little negative self-talk, but a lot of negative thinking about just life in general. And that's Satan playing war games with me, and I need to get through it. I can't make excuses, though, because, again, it'd be so easy to say, given the life I've had, it's absolutely legitimate that I do that. And But you got to pivot. you got you got to change your thinking. you got to be transformed and say, no, 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 no. Satan wants me to believe that. He wants me to live in that place. God wants me to have life abundantly. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to live in that space. I'm going to pivot. I'm going to change this. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm going to think about this differently. So I'm not going to give in to the excuses, the justifications, and not taking responsibility for what I own, and then taking responsibility for what other people want. I'm just not doing it. And you draw a big, thick line. 
You'll be amazed how your life will change. But you got to pray too. I haven't mentioned that yet, but part of this is you got to pray about this stuff. You got to talk to God. You got to ask Him, beg Him for transformation. You got to allow the Holy Spirit to do what He does. You got to listen. You got to listen, not just talk, but you got to listen and see what God tells you, right? Because He's going to ask you to do things that might be hard. Materially, I'd like to use everything I have for God's kingdom. Now, I use a lot of what I have for God's kingdom, but not everything. Um, I like to not be so selfish with my. Uh, time, talents, and treasures, especially some of my time. Time is my my time is my treasure. I mean, I'm happy to give uh, uh, talents and treasures away, but my time, oh man, time is the one I'm a little stingy with, and I don't like people wasting it, and I get irritated very easily, and I don't have spiritual fruit about it, and uh, yeah, that's the one where I need some transformation. Um, uh, now, do I have time? If you looked at my schedule, you say, Tom, you have no time. I mean, you're so busy. Uh, everyone's like, Tom, you're so busy. I, I, I am busy. But I don't have a good attitude about it. Which is bad. Because now I make excuses that, well, you know, I won't schedule this person because, well, you know, I had three other people this week and I'm a little tired and I don't feel so good. <laughs> Stop. Shut up. You're here to serve. My, my job is to serve God. And if God puts somebody in front of me that needs my time, I need to give it to them. Right now with boundaries, because people will suck you dry if you allow them to. But, but boundaries. But the proper boundaries. So I've got to get better at that. And then, um, yeah, I got to stop doing this. My wife's gonna kill me on this one. I'd like to rely less on shopping therapy when I'm when I'm down and depressed. Uh, I'm one of those guys that loves to shop, and it makes me feel better. Having grown up poor, it's nice having money to be able to buy stuff. And it can be little things, little trinkets. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, I need to rely more on God to change my mood than to allow things to change my mood. And so that's a problem for me. And so, uh, again, can I make excuses for that? My wife's screaming in the other room, yay. Can I make excuses for it? Absolutely, I can. When I was young and poor and, and didn't have anything and wanted to change of clothes and was made fun of and all, yeah, there's reasons I have clothes. There's reasons I have shoes. There's reasons I have all the, the latest, greatest stuff um, because of the humiliation I suffered when I was a kid. And there was a lot of it, believe me. Um, but I need God. I don't need that excuse. And so I got to get better at that. I suck at it. And uh, it's something that I, I need to work on, right? And then... Um, I need to be less tied to some of the stuff I own. I'm pretty good about being able to give up stuff. But there's some stuff I'm tied to. And I need to be able to say, eh, it's okay. Um, there's some stuff I'm, I, I really, really like. And so i got to get less materialistic about it and, and be more willing to um, not see it as being as important of, as as much value. So as I run through this thing, uh, and I encourage you to make your own list. Make your list for... Uh, spiritually, emotionally, materially, physically, kind of things you need to make changes in. Things that, that you make excuses to enable whatever you're doing. We all have them. I mean, don't, that's not a lie. We all have them. So, so make your list and then, you know, figure out what you're going to do with God about it. Figure out what your excuses are and say, that's not good enough. We don't need an excuse here. We need, we need, we need a way to reach a result. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. I know I'm a little long tonight, but I told you, I warned you I was going to be. So, I want to walk through real quick how you do this. First, you got to do your part. Okay, remember, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Jesus is alive. He might be in the spirit world, but, it, you know, he's with us. And we may not understand it and get it, but he's here. And so, we have a part to play, and he has a part to play. The Holy Spirit has a part to play. God the Father has a part to play. But you got to do your part. And this is the part that people really struggle with because they're just waiting for God to come down and do stuff for them. That's not how it works. you got to do your part. And God will meet you when you're doing your part and do his part. It aligns, and it's a miracle. It's great. But nothing happens if you don't do your part. And part of that part is uh, you got to work your tail off. You got to work your tail off. You got to stop making excuses. You got to take responsibility and accountability. You got to stop enabling other people. You've got to, you know, do hard, hard things. Because 
It's heaven that matters, not earth. I always got to remember that. You got to take advantage of every opportunity God gives you. You got to walk through every door he opens. No matter how scary, no matter how foreign, no matter how like confusing, walk through it. God knows better than you do. Don't make excuses about not doing for God what he wants you to do. Because most of the time, let's be honest, we know what God wants us to do. We just don't like it. You have to agree that God's plan for you is better than your plan for you. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but it's true. you got to be mission focused. you got to be laser focused on doing what you're supposed to do. And, and your mission is this. Share Jesus with people. Keep your eyes on heavenly things. Your mission is to understand that you are you have been given good works to do for the Lord since the beginning of time. You're the only person who can do the things God set you up to do. You have to figure out what God's going to have you do for the kingdom and then go do it. Regardless of where your circumstances are, go do for the Lord what you're supposed to do. Don't get distracted by Satan's ploys. He's going to put all sorts of shiny things in front of you to try to get you to you know, look away and do something different. Don't fall for it. Don't be ignorant of what he's going to do either, okay? You've got enough experience in your life to know what he's going to do. You seek counsel for more experienced Christians. Um, we all do. you got a question, reach out. Go to the fellowship. Find people and ask them, what do you think about this? Test it versus scripture, all right? Scripture says uh, plans fail for lack of counsel. Don't be that person. And then lastly, you got to stay in the word and you got to pray. And if you want to change from an excuse maker to a results maker, you got to know the word and you got to pray and follow God's leading. That's how you get results. Um, we used to say when we were younger, excuses are like noses. Everyone's got one, except we didn't use the word noses. Everyone's got an excuse. Okay. We as Christians should be the light of the world. People should look at us and say, you're different. And one of the things that makes us different is when we do anything, we take accountability, we take responsibility, we are mission-driven, we are focused on Jesus no matter what, and we don't enable bad behavior. We walk with people to get them to have transformation like us, to know Jesus, so that their behavior can change when they know Jesus, but we don't enable bad behavior. We don't enable in ourselves. And we don't enable in others. Truth is truth, and we all stand by it, no matter how much or how difficult um, it may be for us. It may overwhelm us. It may be something that we are not able to do yet. It may be like, I don't like this at all. My only advice for you is this, suck it up, cupcake. No one said being a Christian would be a joy ride. Jesus said it, it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it, right? So, on this election night, um, where politicians are out there making excuses for everything. Holy mackerel, that's why I just, you know, I used to work in that process for years and years and years and never saw it. But when God opened my eyes, I just I just hate watching this stuff because it is so an, the antithesis of how I want to live my life for Jesus. No excuses. No excuses not to serve. No excuses not to 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 use your talents, your gifts, your treasures. No excuses not to transform. No excuses not to, to live out the truths of God. No excuses not to su submit your will to his. No excuses not to forgive. No excuses to judge. No excuses not to love. No excuses. Yes, it's a walk. Yes, it's a process. But stay on the path. That's my advice for you tonight. Thanks for staying with me. I know it's been late. Um, go out and out and go watch your TVs and see if your candidate won. I hope tomorrow is a brighter day for you, and I will catch you, um, today is Tuesday, I think I'm catching you Friday for First Stone, so Friday night, 7 p.m., right back here. Love all you. Bye now.